is serving the ever-demanding consumer. And I will introduce you to Mark Worth right away. Thank you. Is this working? Yeah. Um, I was prepared to say good afternoon, everybody. But as we're running actually only about 10 minutes ahead of schedule, it's still good morning. So good morning and welcome. Um, I, without further ado, am going to uh, bring on my panel, my esteemed panel. And I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Oh, you know, I'm going to sit over here. Welcome. So we're going to so be yeah. comfortable together. We'll try. Nice oh. and cozy on there. <laughs> um, as you can see, the subject um, of our panel is the serving the ever-demanding consumer. And um, let's start off by introducing ourselves. So we're going to start over here, furthest away. Yeah, furthest away. Hi, my name is Andrew Dimitriou. I uh, manage Young and Rubicam across uh, Europe and Middle East and Africa. And we are an advertising agency, and our sole purpose is actually to figure out how we can create value for our, for our brands and connect them with consumers. So I'm looking forward to the, to the panel. My name is uh, Amit Shafrir, and I have a long and distinguished past uh, with dealing with consumers, mostly in the Internet 1.0 age, things like ICQ, instant messaging, AOL, Netscape, uh, online dating, and overall I reached more than a billion users. Uh, online, so I'm, you know, looking forward to discussing what the users want today. Uh, my name is Eli Uzan. I'm uh, the CEO of uh, Screens. It's a cross-media company working uh, mainly with the entertainment uh, field, but we're part of the media group, uh, Israeli media group called The Box, that have advertising agency and uh, um, investment arm, um, and that's um, um, working mainly working with broadcasters and production companies, uh, brands around the world, mainly in the US, but also here in Europe. Hi, everyone. I'm Michele Eskenazi, Brand Partnerships Director at Blipper. Um, I've been with the company since the early days, so four or five years ago, and working mainly with our brands and clients and brand partnerships, um, and helping them implement augmented reality to transform how they do marketing and how they um, speak with our consumers, so looking forward to share some of those learnings with you today. Um, my name's Tim Weller. I'm clearly the old git on the panel. Um, <laughs> I founded Incisive Media 22 years ago. We're a B2B information and events business, which we took to over a billion and three of enterprise value from startup. I also chair a number of tech and media uh, startups. Trustpilot, you might know, uh, which is a pretty well-recognized reviews platform I'm chairman of. Um, I also sit on Mark's board, um, and I'm chairman of an um, ad tech DMP, which is on the market in the UK called Taptica, uh, the rights exchange, um, which is trying to disrupt the way in which TV production rights are sold digitally, and then finally Ouija, which is a data business in the connected car space. So if Tim's the old get on the panel, God only knows what that makes me. Um, I beat you by a month. <laughs> beat you by a month, hey, absolutely. Well, the glasses that go aren't going on, not so that it makes me look more intelligent, so that it um, hides the bags under my eyes, um, and so I can see. So let's start off, uh, we've got a, a few subjects we want to go through today, and we're going to start <laughs> off talking about relevance, okay? Um, and we know it's a, a bit of a minefield when it comes to behaviors and attitudes, and particularly as they're evolving so quickly. Um, but I, I guess the, the, the big question is how do brands keep up with this issue of relevance? So perhaps we can start. Uh, yeah, I, I think if, if I can say, um, the, the question of relevance comes up uh, a lot actually when we talk with our clients, whether they're fast moving consumer goods or, or high technology clients. And, and I, I think the question is not so much about relevance, actually. The question is, how can brands create value today for a consumer? And I, for us, you know, coming here and looking at things like Unbound, where you see unbound possibilities of technology creating connections potentially with <coughs> consumers, I think the question is, how can, how can brands constantly create value for the consumers? 
So you can only stay relevant if you create value for the consumers. Like, you know, today I called an Uber. Uber creates value for me as, as, as a person, as a consumer. And today I pressed the button and the car was there. That's value and therefore it's relevant. And I think the question of relevance is almost is, is an afterthought because unless you're creating value with our, our consumers and, and, and as an agency, our job is actually to figure out what that value is and figure out how you connect technology to create that value proposition. And I think only then brands can stay relevant, whether it's fast moving consumer goods and or technology for that matter. Mm -hmm. Amit, do you want to add to that? Well, I mean, it's an interesting term relevance and the question to me is always, you don't really have to be relevant to everyone uh, all the time. Uh, you, the, the, the challenge is to figure out how to address just those who you feel you could be relevant to, me, me as, 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 a, as a brand or as a service provider. Uh, and I think if you're able to solve that challenge by only addressing those that you believe you could be relevant to, then the question goes away as part of providing that relevance, because you've already narrowed the field, hopefully not too much, because otherwise you're out of business, but you've narrowed it to just those who you provide relevancy to. That's where I try to focus, and not, not to be very broad. You know, I'm not Coca-Cola. I'm, I'm trying to reach a specific target and a specific audience and be relevant to them by providing the value that I know that they're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's a big relevance in, in general is a very big uh, uh, topic, but I think that if we look at the, the technology uh, area that is happening in the last uh, 15 years or 20, <coughs> is that we see companies like Fuji or Kodak that didn't adopt, uh, you know, the, the, that photos will be, be in every device and that it will become social thing. So to invest in companies like Instagram or to build those, uh, would probably make them relevant. So I think it's one is to create tools that are based on technology. It doesn't really matter if, what kind of brand I am. In, in 2017, it's probably a must. And from the other end is um, tell stories instead of creating a nice slogan. So it's like stories and tools in a way, but this is very general answer. Mm -hmm. Michaela? So I would say, first of all, that there's probably no one size fits all. Every category, every type of... Uh, of, of different industry will have their own relevancy. And I think it's very important to make sure that often we don't fall into the trap of we want to adopt technology and try things just to stay relevant, but really listen specifically to that, uh, to that industry. But in general, I would say that the, the trend as well is to um, sort of try to get away from um, trying to push messages and trying to be on every platform and actually transform um, ourselves into something that is more brand utility, really give that value as you were saying. How am I adding a service? How am I making the consumer journey easier uh, and better for them? And I think that's, that's where it starts and then you can become relevant. I mean, it's quite an, an interesting question for you, Tim, because yeah. unlike most of these uh, businesses, most of which are early stage or startup mm -hmm. businesses, but also consumer facing, mm -hmm. B2, B2B, Yours, of course, incisive is strictly B2, sorry, B2, B2B, um, and been around for, what, 20 years, yep. incisive? Um, so the issue of uh, relevance is particularly important to your business, um, and, and maybe there's a different dynamic in terms of staying relevant to the business user rather than the consumer. Look, I, mean, I, I think, yeah, for the day job, it's, it's pretty simple. We define our market by narrow cast ways because we reach certain business professionals, whether you're a fund manager, whether you're a lawyer, whether you're in the private equity space, our relevance is making sure that our brand has authority, has trust, has integrity. And, you know, I love the fake news shit that's hitting our, the, the, the market <laughs> at the moment because we, we will never run uh, the fake news. We, we, we stand proud that our brands, some of them have been around for, a Post has been around for 170 years, and the only way that we can keep that brand relevant is to ensure that we stick to our principles of cult and, and culture of integrity, authority, and trust, and write the stuff that, that matters. I think if I just could pick up, pick up on your customer services point, which is outside of Incisive, which is, is simple, and I'm not trying to bang the drum of Trustpilot, but we talk about staying relevant on brand and re relevant on product. I mean, I have just had the most horrific journey in the last 48 hours with Sky. Now, I frankly cannot live without Sky. I love Sky. 
and I think the product is bang on and it's relevant because they've invested in the asset. But when you then try and go through the customer journey and you try and have a conversation with them when things don't quite go well, he probably works for Sky, this is what happens, it all falls to bits. Um, <laughs> they are utterly shocking. And the customer journey and the process you go through in trying to get what you want ruins the relevance. It just completely destroys that whole path. So I think you've got to, today, in today's age, particularly with millennials, because they just frankly move on, you've got to not just look at product, yeah. but you've got to look at how that product served and the customer experience and the customer journey yeah. that you go through. And I think that's fundamentally important. Well, thanks, Tim. You know Sky, one of our um, main sponsors. Shit. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding you. Um, yes. <laughs> so so, so let, let's move on with another question. Um, and let's talk about the the touch points of uh, connecting with the, with the consumer. So we all know we've got apps, emails, notifications, beacons, goodness knows what else. Um, how should, what, what should brands be prioritizing at the moment in terms of engaging with their, with their consumer? Again, a good place to start. Yeah, I, you know, we, I just want to pick up on your sky, not to be uh, the sponsors of the, of the event, but if you take that example, maybe they, in, on the customer journey, perhaps, they should have prioritized certain touch points for customers that have urgent demands, that are unhappy, that want certain deliverables. And I, th I don't think you can answer that question unless you get into a specific category, because whether it's the, the customer journey, if you're buying milk, it's very different than if you're buying a Jaguar, you know, because all, all, all of a sudden, your, your milk is a three-second decision that happens in, in the refrigerator aisle in a supermarket, and, and uh, buying a Jaguar, for example, to contrast, you're maybe researching that a, a, a really long time. So things like a lot of information are important. The, the, deal, the dealership is really important. And I think, you know, to, to build on the, the car or automotive example, you, brands like Tesla, have revolutionized the way that the automotives go to market and the touch points. They now have a car in a mall where you can sit and create an experience around and you actually don't need to see another car and you don't need to talk to anyone. So the customer experience is actually the product which is in a retail shopping center, not necessarily on Main Street but, somewhere else. But Tesla is a good case in point because their staff they don't have any people with automotive experience. Exactly. They take tech, and a guy who runs Europe came um, from uh, Yammer. He ran Yammer. So he's a tech guy um, who runs an automotive business. It's an interesting point. So culturally, they've taken that view. Yeah, and I, and I, I think uh, that's a great case where you can't actually prioritize any touch points. I think what you've got to do is prioritize what's the most valuable in the customer journey and how can I create the most value for our consumer in that customer journey. Now, Tesla has obviously made a bet and I think it's paying off for them uh, and the industry trends are, uh, are going that way. But if I'm a, a, a fast moving consumer goods, that's gonna look vastly different than what it does look for, for, for Tesla. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, I think it's, um, it really depends on the category as you mentioned, but I think it really depends if you are uh, in also the phase of uh, engaging with the consumer, if it's before they are buying the product or using it or after, because I think if it's after the category become way more uh, um, significant uh, for the decision. So if it's a vacuum cleaner company, uh, probably IoT gonna become really huge uh, thing in their uh, <coughs> business uh, structure in the, f in the future. Um, and it's, if it's groceries or stuff like that, it will be a bit different. It will be more about marketing and less about uh, the the customer um, experience in a way. Do you not also think that perhaps it's about the um, about competition in the market? So Tesla, for example, were, were they had first mover advantage with the electric cars, pretty much. Um, and the, there will be a lot out there. You know, the course of the next four or five years, everybody will be doing all the coming. So they're fighting for the business. Whereas Sky, as an example, they know they've pretty much got a captive audience. Okay, it's Virgin Media and a couple of others. But at the end of the day they don't have to fight to keep their, their, their client. They, it's, pretty much, it's pretty much a done deal, much more so than in the car industry. So maybe they are a little bit lackadaisical about their, their, their client service um, approach, no? Well, I, I think they're opening the door to competition, if that's their view. Um, they really will. I mean, but I, I also <coughs> think I go, I go back in, 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 this in this touch point question is, 
you know, one, one of our clients, which is, which is Oral-B, they were searching for a competitive advantage, so we actually helped them in, uh, deliver the Bluetooth technology that's in their toothbrush. So now all of a sudden we have an ecosystem of users and we know exactly information, we can give content that adds value, that connects to the dentist and so on and so forth. That is not a touch point that existed before, but it is a touch point created, designed to deliver value for a brand. And I think it, that's the most important part. And I'm sorry if I'm repetitive, but uh, I think for at least for sitting at an advertising agency, that's exactly <coughs> how we try to help connect brands and deliver value uh, along that customer journey. Mm -hmm. Definitely, and to build up on that, actually, you know, you talked a lot about the touch points which are very digital, right? Email, IoT, beacons, all of these things. But actually, the physical touch points are also so important. Mm. And so when you work in augmented reality, obviously you need to be connected to, vis <laughs> to the physical world mo much more. So we spend a tremendous amount of time understanding shopper journeys, how people react both on digital but also in the physical world. And what we realize is that actually the products and the physical items that brands put into the consumer's hands are one of the most powerful things. Mm. You spend so much time with you know, bottles, cans, products, makeup, everything in your hand and I think there's a, um, there's a huge opportunity there to connect all that richness of the digital and put it into the hands of the consumer and a lot of work is being done around that and I think that um, every brand and every um, sort of uh, especially consumer goods should be thinking about how the consumers uses their, um, their items. Amit, do you want to add anything? No, there's uh, no? I don't want to be repetitive. I'll, I'll chime in when I have sure. something. All right, well let's talk, uh, move on. Um, I want to talk about privacy. Um, so, obviously, we all need to try and read the mind of the of the consumer. Um, but how do we do that without invading their privacy? Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe you'd like to start well, with that one. It's an eternal challenge because it's not a question of invading their privacy or not. It's a question of providing the right balance, which sometimes is subjective, to what every person believes is they're willing to give up in order to get a value. Uh, you know, I give up a lot of my privacy by giving Google access to my mail and to my messaging and stuff like that. And that's, I've made that decision consciously or not that that's a good enough value proposition. Um, I don't know that, I don't know how many people here sat around and thought about the fact that if they have a device in their pocket right now, whether it's an Apple or, or, or an Android phone, and whether, if they have um, Siri turned on or uh, Google, forget, OK Google, whatever the name is right now, uh, if it's turned out, whether they've given thought to the fact that it's listening all the time to everything that's going on in their lives, in their homes, in their office, in their bedroom, uh, people probably do not give that much thought, but there is a lot of privacy that has been given up unconsciously. So the question is really what is that that people are willing, when they think about it, to give up and what value they get. There's no subjective measure. Um, there was an outcry a couple of days ago I saw online with Uber that um, Uber has changed something in their settings where they're now um, uh, monitoring your, your location even when you're not using the app. Okay, and people were like, oh, that's a terrible thing and we're not quite sure why Uber is doing that. Now, Uber probably has a certain reason that they're doing it and they're probably thinking they're gonna provide you with better value by knowing where you go or where you went and they're probably providing more value to the bottom line as well, but Uber has, did not do a good job of explaining to the consumer what it is that they're doing and why it's good for them. So they're having a little bit of a problem. Now, is it a big problem or not? You know, if Uber loses a fraction of a percentage of the people to Lyft, big problem or not, I don't know. But it's trying to figure out what is really the value proposition that the vast majority of consumers will say, yes, I'm okay of giving up that privacy. That's really the challenge, I think. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. I think that uh, um, I, will, um, I, I see it with the broadcaster's um, uh, word. Um, content recommendation, it's a huge uh, issue in all any entertainment company around the world having that, that problem at this, those days. And we see that uh, from one hand, you don't know anything about the viewer when you use like a normal set -of box. Um, but from the other end, when I'm open my VOD and I get the same content recommendation of any other consumer, this is really weird on 2017. So me as a consumer feel like they are very old fashioned compared to YouTube that can give me kind of you know, related video. This is a very, very common thing to do with, the, with data. 
So I think it's really, as Amit says, I really agree with it. It's, it's, it's all about the balance between the value that they are getting um, compared to um, what they are paying from privacy or exposure uh, on their lives. Um, I just agreed for um, an app called App in the Air. I don't have shares in it, so a bit of publishing, but a great app for everyone that travels. Um, and I, you know, accept to all their terms and get to my Gmail account and everything because I want to know the average time it's going to take for the passport um, in the next airport that I'm going to get in. Like if it's going to take 22 minutes or 17, so they need to know that data to, to give me that value. So we need to do it with awareness, but I think that, as, as, uh, as you mentioned, is to really explain it to the customers. Like what the example with Uber, I think is very, you know, it's crucial to explain that you are not abuse their data. So, no, I agree with everything that's been said. It's really at the end of about the value exchange. I would also add that we need to create more easy ways to opt in and opt out, because it might be, you know, for a certain week or for a certain amount of time, I actually do want to give my privacy away to get that service, and sometimes I just want to be off. Um, and oftentimes mm -hmm. I feel like it's very difficult to switch between this and that. So I think services and brands and tech companies need to be a, a better job at making that more easy and transparent for the consumer. Mm -hmm. The opt-in, opt-out thing is a, is a currency of our business. I mean, if people opt out, we don't have a business. So um, in, our, in, in the B2B mm -hmm. world. So for us, it's extremely important that whilst I think we learn big lessons by allowing agencies with respect to rape our cookie pools, you know, we allowed, you know, we allowed them to sort of nick our data. Um, we're now much more discreet in the way in which we use our own first party data in our business. And we are myopically focused if we do big email programs to try and get people to events like this, that we make it relevant. We go back to that point that yeah. there has to be a value add and a story told of why we're sending that message. We just don't blunderbuss the message. Um, and that's a learning that we've, we've um, you know, had to take on quite harshly. Because, you know, as I said, if people opt out, we, we, don't, we don't have the currency. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, and I think what's really important in this question of, of data, we have two companies, you know, Google and Facebook, that largely control pretty much 75% of the world's data that's going around. And Tim, you brought up earlier this notion of fake news. One would argue in today's, if you, if you sat in the US or, or as I live in Paris and you get your news feed from Facebook, Hillary Clinton was going to win, Brexit would never happen, and I was very confident that those two social events would never occur, but yet all of a sudden, you know, in my view of the world, was completely distorted apparently to, to, to the reality. And I think there is a big onus, especially on Google and Facebook and how they use their data to be able to customize news for us. I think as marketers, we have an obligation for sure, but I think there is a larger obligation to the two largest uh, data providers, and that's Google and Facebook, to make sure that it's crystal clear of how they're segmenting or tailoring things that get delivered to you. But do you, trust, do you trust the news because it has a Facebook mark on it? Yeah, I know, Th this is, uh, you know. <laughs> If I could add just that the, the issue of privacy and the issue of trust is something that uh, a service can, can earn uh, or needs to earn over time. And what you need to do generally is, is be smart about what you can or cannot do. So this is an example of, this was a long time ago, more than 11 years ago, I ran uh, the biggest music service in, in the US. And the challenge was you get someone new in the door and they're paying, they're paying you $10 a month and you want to provide them a good service, you know nothing about them. This is 11 years ago when we knew even less than we do uh, uh, now. So the only thing we knew was that this person is, you know, Jane Smith, and we knew the date of birth, okay? We knew that because I think we needed to make sure that they're not a child or, what, or for the credit card, for some reason. And that's all we knew. And how do you give someone a music service out of the box knowing nothing about their taste? Are they, are they jazz, are they rock? We knew nothing, but we did figure out that most people, their musical tastes get formed during their high school years. So if I know your age, I pretty much know when you went to high school. So <coughs> the first thing we'd serve you up is those hits that were big when you were in high school. And 80% of the time, we would be right. And you'd see, wow, how do you know I like Pink Floyd? I like Led Zeppelin. This is a great service. It knows a great. Yeah. And now I've earned the trust to get more uh, permission from you to get, learn more about you and provide you with a better service. So you have to figure these kind of things out. Today, you know, you have a lot more to go with other than the date of birth. Okay. 
So moving on, chatbots. Let's talk about chatbots, um, which is currently the, ne the next big thing in digital marketing. Um, why do you think consumers are responding so positively to this sort of engagement? Um, yeah, so I, I think it, we, we live in a world of, you know, whether it's Uberization or instant response, right? So um, there is a, a great uh, video for anyone that wants to see it. It's on YouTube. It's by Lewis KC. He's a comedian in the <laughs> U.S. And he actually talks about, you know, he's on a plane and he, he, he's sitting in and he's finally got Wi-Fi on a plane and it's so amazing. And the guy next to him, he goes out for one minute and he goes, oh, shit damn, my Wi-Fi is gone. And he's like, what, what have we come to today where we believe that everything should be instant? So I think there is a role for Chatbox to serve that I'm upset or I need to find this or where's my nearest Starbucks location. But, you know, if you type into a Chatbox and say my Starbucks coffee is, tastes like crap, I'm not sure that we are at a point in time yet where the chat box is going to say, I'm sorry, here's a, try the next location with, with and, and a free coffee. Um, so there is a role for chat box. I, I never like to say that there's any next big thing in marketing. I just assume that everything is the next big thing and just try to figure out where the value is we can create with consumers, actually. So I'm, I'm, I'm on the one hand, extremely bullish about chat box. Um, but I would say a couple of things. One is the hype is still way bigger than where we're at, both from a technology perspective, yeah. from an adopter's perspective. We aren't there yet. And I don't know if 2017 is when we're there, but we're definitely not there yet. And there, there are a vast number of technology challenges and adoption challenges. There's an interesting perspective, and in that is, so I did a, a little survey with, with a couple of folks I know, uh, you know, extremely bright, very smart, kids 25 and 21, forget the fact that they're my kids, but they're, they're <laughs> very smart. And they told me something that from their perspective, anytime they can interact with a service or a system where humans are not involved, that's the path they would go, okay? And they're, they're not introverts, they're not you know, sitting in a dungeon, they're very social, my kids. But when they can do something without interacting to humans, that's the path they go. So a chatbot, in theory, would serve that, serve them well. However, we need to remember that people make the mistake of, of, of misunderstanding what the, what the chatbots are. There is an interface to them, and they're the chatbot. So the chatbot, let's say, we're talking about brands and services and you know, Sky and Verizon, let's say they all have a service chatbot. That's just a piece of technology. The big question is, how do you interface? Do you interface with your voice? Do you have a mechanism to talk to that? And then there is a question of, who actually gains the personalized knowledge about you? And it's not the chatbot, okay? The thing that knows all, all the stuff that you've done is that layer above, which is most likely gonna be the Googles and the Apples and the Facebook. And they're gonna know that right now you made a call to, to book a flight, okay? So, you, so somehow it went to the flight chatbot. Maybe it's Expedia or Booking, great. But they know that whenever you book a flight, you probably also want a hotel and you probably usually take an Avis car they have that knowledge where they can provide you with that personal level of, of, of uh, value, which is way more than that chatbot, which is really a more mechanical thing. And I think we're going to come back and we're going to see a, we draw a graph of, you know, think about apps on mobile or on Facebook. Uh, on chatbots, you're going to see the same thing. There's going to be an adoption. And then at the end of the day, it's going to be the big four, you know, the Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google, who are going to take all the good value and say, okay, here's a service that we're actually providing you, and everything else is going to go away. So, you know, if, if, you're, a, if you're a betting on chatbots, you'd be know, know where we are on that graph before you make that bet. Okay. Eli? Um, yeah, you basically build, uh, the, make, most of the brands are investing in it or building or cooking that dish for the Google and the big players uh, around the world. But I think there is still a gap between, um, between the technology and the concept. And I think uh, if the timing here is very uh, delicate, like if you think about a consumer, bad experience in this will kill the hype that we are yeah. experiencing. Because it's not that good yet. Like if you, you can have the communication for very, very specific things, it's very limited. Uh, and it needs to be very uh, smart in the way we, we launch new and new products to not uh, abuse 
um, the, the great technology behind it. Uh, it's, it's exactly like launching Siri three years uh, earlier will kill this product. It's, al it's already been like a bit gentle there. So. Michaela, anything? Yeah, so um, definitely agree that there's a, a bit gap. We're still at the beginning of it, and there's still a lot of, of room, but a lot of opportunity as well. So from our angle, we're, we're quite excited about it to see how those um, sort of come to life in an offline environment. So we see, for example, a lot of clients that want to give services on their products. So I'm going to look at a beauty product. I'm going to be in a store, and it's going to tell me what makeup should I put on, what lipstick should I put on, something like that. So right now, we're doing that through you know, understanding what somebody is looking at. But I think if we are able then to add that layer of you know, correspondence and personal assistance, that's going to be very, very powerful when you can combine both those technologies. So lots of opportunity, but we're, we're still quite at early stages um, of that. Tim, don't worry, you're too old to even know what a chat box is. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you quite excited. You're excited? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I've got nothing to add. Nothing to add. Okay. Um, all right, so I think I can't even see the clock there. Is, anybody, is there a clock there? Oh, no? close. Okay, yeah. all right. Uh, have we, well, I think we've got time for one more subject, just to touch on. And it follows on from, uh, from chatbots. And uh, really, do you think that the future of marketing is, in fact, one where marketing becomes pretty much invisible? Very broad question. I, I think the most successful companies are already embedded in culture, actually. So if you think about the most successful marketing companies, whether it's Apple or, quite frankly, Google, who is today, I Google everything. I don't search for it. I Google. Um, I think they're already invisible or so ingrained in culture that we actually don't understand what, what, what the difference is and when they're actually marketing to us. It's just so ingrained in, a, in our day-to-day -day behavior. And I think with, with the advent of technologies and the, and the rapid uh, innovation, what I would say is um, technology is enabling that to become quicker and faster. So I, I, I use a very <coughs> fundamental example. Imagine you were a, a cabinet maker or a kitchen maker. You know, in 1980, you would have to have a retail store with five very specific uh, kitchen designs, and you would hope that someone could come in and try to see one of the designs. Today, I, I, I need a desk, and, and I don't even need a shop front, and I can have a virtual reality headset, and I can design something, and I could put it in their houses, in the way that they look with the cabinets and they could open it to see if they want left or right. That to me is, is not so much whether marketing is invisible or not. It will become culturally relevant for us and it will be value add or we will say no. I mean, as consumers, we have the ability to say no. It's like I love the hang up button on my iPhone because if I don't want to speak to someone, I can just say no. And I think un unless as marketers, we can make sure that we want people to pick up the phone when we call. I think it's, it, it's really that, that, that simple, I guess. I mean, yeah. No, nothing to add. Okay. I've spoken yeah. too much. <laughs> um, maybe just in a, in a sentence that I think it's, it's not about becoming like invisible, it's more about um, different form that it used to be. I think less uh, in your face marketing, uh, advertising, and much more uh, community, real community, not about open like a Facebook page or like real building a community and story behind your brand and creating tools instead of campaigns. So that's maybe the, you know, we see businesses like Airbnb that are based on a tool, yep. on a technology tool. And I think this is, it's not marketing, but it's a real, it's a real value that you give in your product that has become part of marketing. You know? It is marketing. It yeah. Is 2016 yeah, is. marketing. I agree. Yeah. It's just uh, from the traditional, yeah, yeah. Uh, traditional. Not the four Ps, but yes. Yeah, yeah exactly. Michaela? Definitely. So I think uh, we'll definitely have to get away from this sort of hyper push type marketing and you see already consumer responding to that with ad blockers and just saying saying no, saying that they don't want that. Um, so more and more it needs to become frictionless and almost transparent. And that's where technology is going. Technology is going to a place where you almost don't feel that it's technology. You're just going to talk to machines, you're going to look at things with lenses. It's going to be much less disruptive. And I think that there's, there's going to be a, a combination between marketing and technology that's going to make it very very seamless. So I could go, for example, into a store and it would already know, you know, if I'm allergic to something and tell me, yes, you can take that product or not. And I think that's much more of uh, much more powerful marketing because, again, it's a service, it's a brand utility, and it gets away from giving you sort of this 
forceful uh, yeah. message, but rather a service. Tim, you yeah, have the final word. Well, I'll pick up on a, a theme here. I think um, brands, agencies, publishers have a lot to answer for in, I think publishers really allowing agencies to drive our pricing down on desktop, because um, if you look at the disruption we've seen from print to the desktop, the only way that we could monetize our traffic, anything like the way we used to monetize print, was to serve five or six ads on the desktop. Now, when you move to mobile, it's almost impossible to monetize that screen in the same way that you did on desktop. So what we've seen is a disruption uh, that has really created this massive demand for ad, ad blockers because with respect, we've got load times on ads, we've got video load times, we've got creatives that are incredibly intrusive that people just don't want anymore. And um, I think we've got a lot to answer for with that, the whole industry, because we've created this monster that won't go away. And certainly if you're in Germany, 30%, I think, of content's now blocked. A couple of the assets I have in my business Close to 30% of our content was blocked. We don't allow them to see it for free, to be fair now. They have to take advertising. But we're, you know, we're looking at now time on site. We're looking at in view as opposed to obtrusive stuff. But I also think just one final point, again, which is sort of related to marketing. And I look at my experience, again, with our editors in our business. And of course, the editor's job in the old days was you know, this individual who was a curator. They had opinion. They had a gut feeling for what they thought their customer wanted to see, and they then created a, a, you know, a front page and a back page, whether it was digital or, or not, and they, they, they edited stuff. Um, now we are so data-centric that every story we write um, gets added to, frankly, the eyeballs come our way. Um, it's why you see the bloody Cardassians on the bar of shame every day of the week, you know, in the Daily Mail. And actually, over time, it will lose its spice because the curation and editorship's gone. And I think we've got to be careful that data isn't the only metric we look at, that we do allow people who have insight and knowledge and understanding to, to basically then push stuff that they think tells a story that's important. Mm -hmm. And that, that's not just content distribution, that goes to the way in which you know, your stories are told through native or um, through, through marketing. And I think that's a good place uh, to end. I don't know if we've overrun or underrun, but whatever, I'd like to thank all of our panelists for taking part. And um, thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.